I want you to notice the scripture verse today, Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 9. It says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This morning, I want to talk a little bit about the will of God. First, it must be God's will for you to know his will. Because this is scripture inspired by the spirit and Paul would not pray for something God did not want you to have. Amen. Now the will of God is what pleases him and his plans for you. The will of God is his desires and designs for your life. And one main point I want to leave with you is this. The will of God is in two parts. There is God's general will and also his specific will. His general will and his specific will. Now, those terms are not found in the Bible. However, we see that concept throughout the scripture. So you could uh, use some different terminology, but the idea is what matters most. God's general will is what he wants for all of us and what he expects from all of us. It's true in all places, in all times, and for all people. That's God's general will, you see. And the Word of God reveals to us God's general will for our lives. So, for example, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9, the Bible says, Do not lie to one another. Don't look so sad. I said, do not lie to one another. So that's God's general will. That applies to every one of us. Whether you've been a Christian for 10 minutes or 10 years. Amen. Whether you're a prophet or a plumber. Amen. Amen. Whether the circumstance seems easy to tell the truth or more difficult to tell the truth. It's God's will for you to tell the truth. But some Christians seem to think that it's permissible to tell a lie sometimes. Sometimes it's okay to tell a lie. I didn't want to hurt her feelings. So I told a fib. It's just a little white lie. The Bible does not color code our lies. There is no measurement system. A lie is a lie. It is never God's will for you to engage in deception or bear false witness. If you don't believe me, if you ever meet them, ask Ananias and Sapphira. They died for telling a lie. It's not because they didn't tithe, like some pastors think. It's because they lied. And by the way, think about this. Ananias did not express this verbally, but by his actions, he misrepresented the truth. Yet that was a lie. Peter said, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. For example, we might ask, how many of you here tithe? And you might lift your hands. We haven't said anything, but you might be Ananias. Now, some people, let's just, let's just be here for a little moment. Some people would argue, wait a minute, Pastor John. Abraham told a lie. Hmm? I read in the Bible that he said, this is my sister. When in fact, actually, it was his wife. The scripture commends Abraham for his faith. It does not commend him for lying. I mean, Noah not only built an ark and obeyed God, he also got drunk. That doesn't mean that when you get drunk, you can say, praise the Lord, I'm just like Noah. 
That doesn't make it okay. He was wrong and you would be wrong. Actually, Abraham told a half truth. She was, Sarah was his stepsister, but she, they were married. So be careful about a half truth. You may get the wrong half. And a half truth is a whole lie. And the interesting thing about it, ironically, Abimelech, who was the king of Gerar, of the Philistines, reprimanded Abraham, scolded him for not being truthful, and said to him in Genesis chapter 20 and verse 9, you have done to me things that not ought to be done. Now, usually it's the prophet of God that's rebuking the Gentile king. Now the roles are reversed. It's really a sad thing when the heathen have more integrity than the Christians. God's general will is unchangeable. Where you go, the passage of time, it will always be valid. Amen? Brother Hagen was holding a meeting in one particular church in America. And a man approached him and said, Brother Hagen, I'm in love with one woman in this church. The only problem is she's married. <laughs> so, Brother Hagen, I want you to pray that she'll leave her husband and marry me. Well, the Bible says, and we could read a lot of verses, but here's just... Two, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11, that chapter talks about marriage, says the wife should not separate from her husband. But then it goes on to say, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. God's not going to help you split up the, another man's marriage just because you have eyes for his wife. Amen. I don't care. Like, Well, you know, I really feel this is the Lord. You're feeling something else. It's not the Lord that you're feeling. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And then some people will say, yeah, but doesn't the Bible say all things are possible? <laughs> For the one who believes. Yeah, it does say that. Mark 9, 23 does say that. But like Jesus said to the devil in the wilderness, it is also written, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith is not what some people think. It's not Aladdin's lamp that you rub and a genie appears and says, you got three wishes. Faith is the persuaded attitude of our hearts in response to God's word. Believing just anything you wish is not faith. It's fantasy. This is a big mistake that so many people make. Oh, I'm believing God for this. I'm just, I just believe that this will happen. And I always want to say, and what scriptures are you basing that faith on? Uh, well, I just want it. That's not good enough. Faith that is not based on the scripture is baseless. It's not believing, it's make-believe. Base your faith on the word of God. F.F. F. Bosworth, wonderful man of God who wrote the classic book, Christ the Healer, I would encourage you to read that, said this, it is impossible to boldly claim by faith a blessing that we are not certain God offers. It's impossible. To boldly claim by faith a blessing that we are not certain God is offering to us. See, faith receives the will of God. It doesn't change the will of God. He went on to say, the power of God can be claimed only where the will of God is known. Then again, God has not only a general will, which is for everyone. He has a specific will. Again, I'm using these terms. You might use different language, but the thought is, is what matters. God's specific will is his unique plan or assignment for you. And it is only 
for you. Not necessarily for anybody else. This is God's plan, his assignment just for you. Amen? His specific will is also his guidance for any, at any particular moment. God's specific will is conditional and it is subject to change. God's general will is timeless. His specific will is often time-based. It may have an expiration date attached to it. For example, the Lord might deal with you, lead you, speak to you and say, go visit brother Zama Zama because he's hurting. But if you wait a year to do it, it may no longer be valid. God's specific will for our lives is revealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, for example, every Christian is called to evangelize. Did you know that? To share the gospel, the good news with somebody else. If you don't have a desire to share Christ with someone else, when I give the altar call, you need to respond because you're lost. You're just a fake Christian. I said, if you don't have a desire to see others come to Christ, you need to get saved yourself. You're a fake Christian. Are you listening to me? However, not every Christian is called to be an evangelist. Every one of us can share with others the things we have learned. But some are called to the office of a teacher in the body of Christ. Amen. There are some Christians who are maybe over eager to serve and in doing so they intrude into places God has not called them to. See, if you don't go where God is sending you, you're going to get in trouble. If you do go where God didn't send you, you're going to get in trouble. The ministry is like a wedding reception by invitation only. You have to be invited. Same with the ministry. You don't push yourself. You don't push the door open. You have to be called. On the same topic, it's not enough to know what God has called you to do. You also need to know when and where. And some people are operating on incomplete information. They say like, well, I, believe, I know God's called me to pastor, and so that means I can just go anywhere. I throw a dart at the map, and wherever it lands, that's where I'll go. Or some folks will even say, God's called me to start a church. So they leave their home church, a church that's been good to them, a good church, and they go down the street and take several members with them. That's unethical. That's um, not God. God didn't ask you to do that. I can't believe that. That's dishonorable. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Hallelujah. God's specific will is where he wants you to be. His assignment for you. What he's asking you to do, not someone else. Now, during a time of drought, God sent Elijah, the prophet, to a brook, a small stream of water, called Cherith. He drank from the stream, and the ravens brought him food. But what if Elijah had decided to go somewhere else? I don't want to go to Cherith. That's too far away. There's a little river here by my house. I'll go there. He would have suffered lack. Many people in the body of Christ struggle financially because they're not in their place of grace. They are not in the will of God for their life. Well, brothers, brother, brother Doohickey went there and he really flourished, but you're not Brother Doohickey. Some folks say, well, that's what I'm going to do. I read about Elijah. I'm going to just live by the river and the birds will feed me. Your name is not Elijah, and God didn't send you to that river. You cannot copy someone else's experience. You have to hear from God yourself. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says that after a time, the brook dried up. The water dried up because it had not rained for three and a half years. So then God spoke to Elijah a second time. See? 
and said, I'm sending you to a city called Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And a widow will provide for you. See? But what if Elijah had said, I'm not going to go to a foreign country. Huh. There are plenty of widows here in Israel. He might have starved to death. You see? Or what if Elijah had said, no, I heard from God about Cherith. I have the Cherith revelation. So I'm going to just stay here until I die. We're going to build a Cherith tabernacle. I'll be Cherith Ministries. And we're going to, that's going to be the, the, the cornerstone of our doctrine, the Cherith doctrine. That's what churches do. That's what people do all the time. You know, God told us to paint the wall blue. A hundred years from now, it's still blue. God, God can change and say, okay, now, now paint, it, paint it black. He said, okay, now it's time to go somewhere else. Because God's specific directions and plans as he guides you are time-based and they are changeable. I mean, I'm, I meet people all the time. I know God told me that I'm supposed to marry Sister Doohickey. And then Sister Doohickey marries someone else. Well, evidently the plan has changed. Yeah. Amen. I've heard some people say, if it's yes today, it'll be yes tomorrow. That's not necessarily true. You cannot make a doctrine out of God's specific will for your life. Maybe somebody, you know, like they were in a meeting and they needed healing. And the Lord said to them, I want you to come and kneel. The Spirit of God spoke to me. I want you to come and kneel at this altar and you'll receive your healing. Well, that, that's God giving you specific directions on what he wants you to do. Just like Elisha told Naaman the Syrian to dip in the river Jordan seven times. But he never said that to anybody else. And you can't make a doctrine out of that. Well, I have the kneeling at the altar ministry. I have learned the secret of being healed. You have to wait till the third song and then you have to come. You have to, no, not over there. You have to be over here because that's where I was when I got healed. No, no, you're making a doctrine out of your own experience. Now, being in the will of God may cost you something. But being out of the will of God is infinitely more expensive and dangerous. I said it's dangerous. You can get into trouble by being out of God's general will or his specific will for your life. Did you, listen? Did you hear me? You can get into trouble either way. By ignoring God's general will, which is for everybody, or his specific will, which is just for you. Either way, you're going to get in trouble. For example, David was called and anointed to be king over Israel. But he violated God's general will. Which, by the way, is also called dun, 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 sin. Because... He committed adultery with Bathsheba and then conspired to have her husband killed. See, so he violated the will of God. No question about that. Right. And furthermore, David was married. Right. And not only that, he had several wives. I'm not suggesting that you follow that example. I don't think that's a good idea. We don't believe in polygamy in this church because the Bible says no man can serve two masters. David had a stable full of ponies. He didn't need to steal some poor man's horse. <laughs> He's got enough of his own. You understand? So this doubly bad. And what ensued in David's life was a series of tragedies. Very sad. First of all, the baby that was born to Bathsheba died. Though he prayed and fasted, doesn't matter. Baby died. Then David's son, Amnon, sexually assaulted his half-sister, Tamar. Terrible. And the thing that's even worse, I suppose, David didn't even bother to reprimand Amnon. I guess... David felt like he didn't have the moral authority to correct his son 
since he himself basically did the same thing. He didn't exactly rape Bathsheba, but he's king and he called her. What can she do about it? Then Absalom, the brother of the girl Tamar, conspired to kill Amnon. That sounds very familiar, just like David did. Not only that, he led a coup, a coup d'etat. He toppled the government. He took over the kingdom. David and all of his entourage had to flee Jerusalem in fear and shame. And in the end, there was a civil war. A war. And Absalom was killed in battle. See? Now, when David was confronted by Nathan the prophet, David immediately repented said, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said, and your sin is taken away. That's amazing. I mean, it's a terrible thing. He, he had a man murdered. He had a man, he conspired to have this guy killed. And he says, I've sinned against the Lord. And God said, you're forgiven. But that's not all Nathan said. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 10, the prophet said, the sword shall never depart from your house. There are consequences to our actions. There are consequences. It's important that we stay in the will of God. It can cost us dearly. Thank God for his mercy. Don't misunderstand me. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. But on the other hand, God forgives and forgets. People don't. Maybe they should, but they don't. And some people will hold that against you till the day you die. It's just better not to go there. Many years ago, we're talking about the will of God, you see. Many years ago, I, I was, uh, in fact, I was, I was in my early 20s, so that was a couple of years ago. Many year, a couple of years ago, I, I met, a, I met a, a, a man of God, a wonderful man of God. He had tremendous faith, amazing faith. And uh, wonderful healings were taking place under his ministry. Even, according to what I know, even a woman was raised from the dead through his, his, his prayers, you see. And he had a gift. I, I would just say he had a gift of leading others to Christ. He could get more people saved by accident than you or I could do on purpose. Just amazing. He had just something there, this, this grace, this anointing upon his life. Now, he had been divorced. Uh, he, he, his marriage broke up, but that was before he knew the Lord. He, he, it was before he, he had come to Christ. And he started, he got interested in, in a young lady. She's a fine person and everything. I, I don't know, but in my opinion, maybe they were too hasty, but they got married. Okay, fine. And then shortly thereafter, very shortly thereafter, they divorced. And um, later, he married another girl. So this is number three now. And, and, and I met this girl, a young lady. She was a nice, a nice woman of God. She, she loved the Lord, seemed like a, a sweet person to me. And, and um, they got married. But they had some issues. For one thing... You know, uh, she wanted to, like, have a home and a family like any woman would. But he wanted to live in his van. Drive around like a Holy Ghost gypsy. Which, honestly, I'm telling you, no, hardly one in a million women would want to live that way. Maybe someone would. So they should have discussed these issues before they got married. Or after they got married, they should have tried to settle their differences somehow. But instead... He just pulled the plug on the thing and they got divorced because that's not God's will. That's what he says. Oh, this is not God's will. And then I, I didn't have con much contact with him after that. Our, our ways kind of parted. Um, and I think he married again. And here's the thing. I noticed that that anointing that was on his life, that just dissipated. That just disappeared. And the testimonies of miraculous healings those just evaporated. And his, his, his ministry just deteriorated to nothing. 
the best he could do was post a few things on Facebook. What I'm saying is this. It doesn't matter how many scripture verses you know. It doesn't matter how wonderfully God has used you in the past. If you violate his will, things will not go well for you. It's going to cost you. Now, at this point, there are some Christians who will say, Pastor John, we're not under the law. We're free in Jesus. Some people always say that just before they do something they shouldn't do. We're free in Jesus. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, we read, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You can't use your freedom as an excuse to sin. We are free to serve, not free to sin. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. I want to say this because I've, I've kind of stayed on this point for a while. I realize, I realize there are often extenuating circumstances. It takes two people to have a great marriage. It only takes one person to mess it up. There are cases where maybe the husband abandoned the marriage and left, left the wife alone and helpless. What is she going to do? There are, there are people who have been dragged to the divorce court against their will. They didn't want to get a divorce, but the other person forced it. There are cases where the husband drank himself to oblivion. And, and, and the woman, she really had no choice. She couldn't stay in that situation. I understand those circumstances. I got that. But my main point is this. As much as it depends on us, we need to stay in the will of God. Amen. Why? Because the more we align ourselves with God's will, the more we will experience his grace. Grace is unmerited, but it's not unqualified. I said grace is unmerited. You don't deserve it. You don't pay for it. You don't buy it. But it is not unqualified. For by grace you are saved through faith. Some people don't have faith. So that's why they're not saved. They don't receive that grace. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. For God gives grace to the humble. Well some people don't humble themselves. So that's grace they don't have. There are qualifications for the grace of God. Can I get an amen? amen. The more closely I align my life with God's will. The more I experience his grace. Now God said to Jonah. Go to Nineveh. But he decided to go as far away from God as possible. He boarded a ship for Tarshish, which was probably modern day Spain. So that's the opposite side of the Mediterranean Sea. If he kept on going, he would have discovered America. But he, but he, he tried to get as far away from God as possible. And a terrible storm arose, you see. And the crew of the ship feared for their lives. That tells me that being out of God's will not only puts your own life at risk, it endangers others, the other people in the ship. And so Jonah, it's, it's rather interesting, Jonah told the men to throw him overboard. And when they reluctantly did, the storm ceased. Some people will never have peace until they jettison the Jonas in their life. Are you listening to me? Some people will never have peace till they jettison the Jonas in their life. But I want to tell you, that wasn't the end of the story. The Bible says in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17, you know it. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And the interesting thing is, we read that he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights before he prayed. For me, I would have been on that boat and as soon as there was a storm, I would have started praying. If they threw me overboard, I would have started praying. If a fish swallowed me I, in, in his mouth, I would have started praying. He sat there or laid there in the large intestine of some great fish waiting for three days. Some people are really stubborn. In other words, sometimes the reason you're in a bad place is because you just will not surrender to the will of God. Amen? Amen. He prayed. 
In Jonah chapter 2, verse 10, we read, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and the fish vomited up Jonah. You cannot keep a good man down. Hallelujah. He vomited up Jonah. So that fish was more obedient than Jonah. As soon as God spoke, it came right out. But Jonah waited three days. So then Jonah went to Nineveh. This is what God said to do. He went to Nineveh, and he preached the message that God gave him. In 40 days, the city of Nineveh will be destroyed. And the thing that happened is, Jonah chapter 3 verse 5 says, And the people of Nineveh believed God. And from top to bottom, they repented. From king to cobbler, prince to pauper, they fasted wearing sackcloth to show their humility. They, they, they turned to God. Tremendous success. You preach one sermon, the whole city, and it's, it's, it's a major city. It's a mighty city uh, of ancient times. The whole city turns to God. And Jonah was angry. He was majorly ticked off. He was, he was very grieved and angry, you see. He wanted God to smoke him. He wanted God to wipe him out. That's why he didn't want to go there in the first place. <laughs> so, when, when God's sending you somewhere, it's to bless people, not to ruin them. God's sending you to help people, not to hurt them. He's sending you to show his mercy to them, not to bring damnation on their heads. So his, his very motives are wrong. Now, as, here's my point. As far as I know, Jonah was not a thief. He didn't tell a lie. He didn't defraud anybody out of money. He wasn't immoral. So he was in God's general will, as far as I know. But he was out of God's specific will. And he found himself in a very unpleasant place, a lot worse than Nineveh the digest, digestive system of a fish. So that means you might think that being out of the will of God is be better, but trust me, it's gonna be a whole lot worse. He preached one message, the whole city repented. That seems kind of amazing. It might be interesting to note that the Assyrians, the people who lived there, they worshiped a God called Dagon, who was half fish, false god of Dagon, half fish and half man. And so I'm sure somebody saw this fish cough up Jonah on the shore because Jonah didn't drown in the Mediterranean Sea. He must have got to land somehow. So they must have seen this happen. And when they heard, this is a man that came out of the belly of a fish, they thought Dagon has sent him. And of course, they turn to the true and living God. God can even use your blunders for his glory. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want to just read this verse again. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. It says, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So not only can we know God's will, we can be filled with that knowledge. You fill a container, you fill a bucket, you fill a cup, you fill a room. So what in us is filled with this knowledge? He went on to say, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. It's not enough to have a mental knowledge of the scriptures and of God's will. Your spirit needs to be saturated with that knowledge, amen? And the Greek word for knowledge, epignos, means complete knowledge, full knowledge, uh, accurate knowledge. So that means not only can you know God's will, you can have precise knowledge. You can know exactly what God wants you to do in any particular situation. Instead of just kind of vague, general, kind of unclear, well, I guess God wants me just to, you know, whatever, just be a good person. So that's very, very imprecise. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. He went on to say in verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. 
Knowing God's will should affect our walk. It should affect the way we live. God doesn't want to give you knowledge just so you have something to talk about after dinner. He wants it to change the way we live. He says that you may walk in a worthy manner. He didn't say that you would be worthy. You don't deserve even the smallest blessings from God, but worthily, or that means suitable, appropriate, that which is proper for a Christian. The contemporary English version says that you, then you will live a life that honors God, fully pleasing him. So you cannot please God, even, even if you're sincere and earnest, you can't please him if you don't know what pleases him. That's why you need the knowledge of his will. God is not an idea. He's a person. And like every person, he has his likes and dislikes. Things that he cares for, things he doesn't care for. Listen to me. Sometimes there's a, a thing, an idea, something that's going on. And inside my spirit, I don't like it. You know, I, I don't a program or some uh, idea or something. And I just don't, or some person, I don't feel right about it. And what I've learned is... If, if, and I, I sense in my spirit, and if I don't like it, I don't have to give you a reason why. Because the Spirit of God is telling me, no, no, that's not for you. We, we, if we lean too much to our own understanding, we're not going to walk in the paths that God has preordained for us. Bearing fruit in every good work. God doesn't want you just to be busy. He wants you to be productive, you see. But you won't see any meaningful, lasting results from our efforts, particularly serving the Lord without the knowledge of His will. Without the knowledge of His will, our prayers will be ineffective and our faith will be futile. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Then he says, increasing in the knowledge of God. A man is defined by his desires. Likewise, when you know what God wants, you know who God is. When you know what God prizes, you understand who he is as a person. Hallelujah. Then he says in verse 11, strengthened with all power. God will strengthen you to do his will. He's not going to strengthen you to do your will. So if there's no strength there supernatural ability released by the favor of God, it might be that you need to make an adjustment. Brother Hagin said that, you know, he pastored for 12 years and in each church, uh, he, he preached in different churches, each church he would pray and wait on the Lord until he had a, a sense in his heart that I should accept the pastorate of this church or this is not the church I should take. A and he said, but one time he got like, tried to take a shortcut. He said, instead of praying and waiting until he heard from the Lord, he just said, I'll put out a fleece. You know, I look for a sign. God, if this is your will, you know, then let this happen. If this is not your will, then let that happen. You know, people do that sometimes. They, they say like, if it's your will that I should marry Sister Susie, let it rain tomorrow. But it might rain tomorrow anyways. You know, if it's, if it's your will that I should uh, go to this particular school, then have somebody walk up to me and say the word hot. But it, they might say it anyways, you know, so that's not a reliable way. I don't recommend that way. We should be led by the Holy Spirit, not led by circumstances, because circumstances can be confusing, get you off track. So he put out a fleece and the fleece said, take the church. So he took the church and he said, I, for, for, he was there for one year. He said, during that year, I had no anointing at all. I would try to preach and it was just like my words just fell to the ground. He said, I would pray and I would get on fire for God. When I walked into the building, it's like somebody poured a bucket of cold water on me. Why? Because he was not in the will of God. When the year was up, they said, please stay another year. He says, wild horses could not keep me in this church. He went to, he, he prayed, he was led, he went to another church. Later, those same people heard him preach in another church and they said, wow, you didn't preach like that when you were with us. He said, because we were out of the will of God. We were not in the will of God. Amen. He went on to say in verse 11, for all endurance and patience with joy. Being in the will of God often requires stamina. Stay with it. You think God says, okay, this is where I want you to go. And when you get there, everybody's going to be cheering and roll out a red carpet. And the birds will be singing and, and the sky is blue. And that's probably not what's going to happen. It's going to be, there's going to be some challenges. There's going to be some difficulties. God deals with you. I want you to be involved in this ministry. And then, you know, you get your feelings hurt. Or, 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 or somebody criticizes you or, or whatever. And then you feel like quitting. Someone asked me recently, Pastor John, do you ever feel like quitting? I said, every day. 
But you need, you need to have endurance. My pastor, Pastor Phil Jr. is my pastor's son, was recently here. My pastor said that many a Sunday after the service was over, he went home to his house and told the Lord, I quit. I'm finished. I might do that this afternoon. I'm not sure. I quit. I'm finished. I give, I'm not going to pastor this church anymore. I'm done. Goodbye. I'm over. You know, especially if something doesn't go right. You, know, you don't feel like the service went well, what have you. It, a thousand reasons. But then he said, when I went to sleep that night, something just began to deal with me. And I woke up the next morning, Monday, and I thought, well, no, I got I to gotta go. I'm still a pastor here. So he came to church on Monday morning in the office, you know, to continue his work. Years later, he was praying and he said, Lord, all those times, every Sunday I told you I quit. I, I just want to repent. I, I, I'm sorry that I quit on you so often. The Lord said to him, son, I don't care how many times you quit on Sunday, as long as you come to the office on time on Monday. So you may quit a thousand times. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But just go ahead and do it. It'll be all right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So notice he said endurance and patience with joy. God doesn't want you just to finish your course. He wants you to finish your course with joy. We're not supposed to crawl across the finish line all beat up and bruised and half backslidden and you know, bitter and angry at the world. We're supposed to shine. We, the, the Greeks brought to us the modern Olympics and the feature event was the marathon race. But in the Greek Olympics, the marathon runners ran with a lit torch. The winner was not the first person to finish the race. It was the first person to finish the race with his torch still lit. Keep your torch lit. Keep the fire. Keep the love. Hallelujah. Walking in, in, in the grace of God. Don't become, you know, sour on everybody else. Some of the most angry, bitter people are in the church world. Don't look left or right right now. Just look right at me. Amen. Hallelujah. Joy. Joy will strengthen you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah. That means you can rejoice. The Bible says in everything, in, in everything give thanks. Rejoice always. That's God's general will, isn't it? That's God's general will. It, it, rejoice evermore. We should be more joyful. Come on. Some people are looking for some special revelation. They're ignoring the general revelation, which is already there. I want an angel. How about the Bible? Eh. No, you got to just do what the Bible says. Hallelujah. See, some Christians are asking, what about this? What about this? Do what you know to do. And if you need to know something else, God will show even this to you. I just don't know what my purpose is. Well, let me help you. Sunday morning, wake up, take a bath, put on decent clothes and come to church. Thus saith Pastor John. (laughs) Just do what you know to do. Do what you know to do. Wake up Monday morning, go to work. Be joyful. Be thankful. I hate this job. At least you have one. Man, this traffic is killing me. At least you have a vehicle, some way to get there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Need I remind you that complaining is not praying. Hallelujah. Amen. Be joyful. Joy will strengthen you. So when you need more endurance, you need to release your joy. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, one little simple phrase that will help all of us, myself included, is say, praise God anyways. Praise God anyways. Load shedding all night. (laughs) Praise God anyways. (laughs) (laughs) Traffic jam. Demopore style. People are making four, five, six lanes, and I've been waiting here patient. Praise God anyways. (laughs) Hallelujah. Praise God anyways. Things, it rained on your birthday party. Praise God anyways. No one even acknowledged your birthday. Well, maybe that's a blessing. Praise God anyways. <laughs> Hallelujah. With joy. It takes, God doesn't want you just to do his will. Begrudgingly. All right, I'm here. All right. Okay, it's time to give. Oh boy, oh boy. Forget it. Keep your money and keep your bad attitude. God wants you to Enjoy his will. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and I know sometimes it's hard. I, I, hey, we all know that. Sometimes it's, it's not easy sometimes just to, just to walk in love to some, with some people. Right? Do you know anyone that's difficult to love? You, you are that person? Okay. Anyway, anyways, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. 
but joy will make it easier. I'm going to do this for you. Hallelujah. Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Finish your course with joy. Then notice this. Verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father. Ever thank God for His will for your life? I wish I was born somewhere else. I wish I lived in the 1700s. You're reading too many novels, Charles Dickens novels. <laughs> God brought you into His kingdom for such a time as this. He, he, he decided you would be born to you, those parents at this particular geographical place. Hallelujah. Thank God for it. Man, there's so much crazy things happening in the world because the end is near. And we're part of that generation that's getting ready to see the second coming of Christ. Thank God. We're, we're in a place where previous generations just dreamed about, wondered about. We're there. Come on. Come on. I think I feel like this. Listen. Your grandparents didn't know half of what you know in God's Word. They didn't even know it. Some of them didn't even know a tenth of what you have been exposed to. M most of you. Yet they seem to be happier with what little they had than with the great bounty you have. Thank God. Thank God for the knowledge of the Word, for the knowledge of His will. Thank God for all He's invested in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, some people can thank God for their motorbike, fine. They can thank God for their new car, fine. But have you ever considered thanking God for the true riches of the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, the grace of God in your life? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Before man dies, he writes his will. His will. This is how I want all of my property to be distributed. The New Testament is the will of Jesus Christ. It's how he wanted his grace, his favor, his blessings, all the riches of heaven to be distributed to the saints who are in the kingdom of God's light. The New Testament is not just a book of encouragement and correction. That, yeah, sure, but it's a legal document. It show, it's the w last will and testament of Jesus Christ. It shows us this is what belongs to us. Hallelujah, because of the cross. So we know God's general will by carefully following the word of God. In every situation, ask yourself, what does the Bible say about this? We know God's specific will by being prayerful. It's better to have a continued prayer life than an extended prayer meeting. Smith Wigglesworth said this, I don't often spend more than half an hour in prayer at one time. But I never go more than half an hour without praying. I don't often spend more than half an hour, 30 minutes, in prayer at one time. I never pray longer than 30 minutes, rarely. But I never go more than half an hour without praying. Have a prayer life. See, some people just kind of live carnally and then spend one week on Mount Saramati at a prayer center. There's a better way to live, that you walk with God every day, that you're a prayerful person, that you have a prayer life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's specific will for your life will never be at variance with his general will. He's not going to tell you to do something that contradicts the Bible. Amen. Put the word of God first place in your life. Most people don't need a special revelation. They just need to walk in the light. They already have God's general revelation. The old saying is you take care of the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. If you just do what the Word of God says, all that you know, then God will give you more light. He'll make it more clear to you.